Uh, so once again, yeah, my name is Alexander Novichichin. I hope you guys forgive me for bringing the water with me. I'm a bit dry from yesterday, and I guess it's also the reason there's not that many people over here. So my presentation uh, is going to be less focused on the products. Uh, honestly, I mean, if you're interested in any of our products, you are free to come look at our booth, where there's plenty of them. But what I'm going to be talking more about is the actual industry trends, uh, a recent research that we did jointly with IDC that highlights uh, what's going to happen with the storage industry till 2025. It's called Data Age 2025, and if you like any of the next five to seven slides, you're more than welcome to download it at datage2025.com. Then just a few words about the recent technology innovations that we use in our products. Industry snapshot in terms of uh, thumb size, uh, market share size, and then the million dollar question that when I joined Seagate 10 years ago was still around about the impact of flash, when I'm going to flash and none drives overtake HDDs. And the short answer is not anytime soon. So the Seagate story. Uh, basically, uh, by the way, Seagate is going to be 40 years uh, this year, so another anniversary as well as Elko. And with Elko, I think we've been together for 24 years. So like first year after Elko started, uh, we signed the contract. Our vision and our mission is quite simple. We help people and organizations craft and create the data sphere. And what is the data sphere? The data sphere is defined as the sum of all data that was created, produced uh, in a certain given amount of time in the world. And uh, if you look at the graph, I mean, we've been showing quite, quite similar exponential graphs for a while already, and the interesting thing is that they all turn true after a few years, is that by 2025, we're going to be looking at about 160 zettabyte of data being created in the world. Uh, the one problem is that it's a 10-time growth compared to 2016. The second problem is that probably uh, even if we continue the current growth trend both in HDD industry and in NAND industry as well, there's simply not going to be enough space anywhere to create that amount of data. Just for your understanding at how big the number is, the whole HDD industry shipped a mere 4 zettabyte in the last 20 years. This year we are potentially looking at maybe shipping 1 zettabyte combined. Uh, so in the first quarter, again, combined, we only produced 200 exabytes. And one zettabyte is 1,000 of exabytes. I mean, of course, the amount of data that's going to be stored is going to grow, uh, but it's going to grow at a much slower pace than the demand for data itself. And uh, in that report, IDC is highlighting some of the key trends that are not just changing and explaining how and why all the data is created, but also... Uh, is explaining how the nature that's being created and potentially stored is being changed as well. So the first trend is uh, they're saying that uh, by 2025 we're going to see much, much more data that we can call either life critical or uh, life uh, uh, ultra critical, something like that. Uh, and basically that number is going to grow to as much as 20 to 30 percent of the overall data created. And it's quite simple where the data is going to come from. For example, we, we have the promise of self-driving cars for a while already, and definitely all the data that your PC that's installed in the car is collecting related to the outside environment is critical, not just to the people who are in that car, but also to the pedestrians and you know the, all the people that are on the highway. Uh, we're going to see much more medical devices, medical sensors uh, being either embedded or uh, wearable devices uh, that are going to process much more important health information, not just the heart pulse rate like uh, it is happening now. And uh, potentially information related to commercial air flights, stuff like that. We can all say that it's life critical. Uh, also, the growth in the data is definitely going to come from the growth in embedded systems and uh, Internet of thi Things system. Uh, TP-Link booth over there is, I think, a pretty good example of how in the near future you might have all your light bulbs being connected to Wi-Fi and Internet or your power plugs also being connected to Wi-Fi and Internet because uh, 
you know, you can track how much electricity you spend. So all those smaller devices uh, are generating lots of data that, you know, we need to decide either we're going to store it or we're going to disregard it or we're going to just store the metadata about it. Uh, also, the change in the trend of the data is we want most of the data that we store to be readily accessible, uh, preferably at the palm of our hands, uh, more preferably from a smartphone device, uh, and you know, as quick as possible. Uh, so this drives the rise of the so-called edge. That's a bit of a new buzzword, maybe. Uh, I'm going to be talking about it a bit later. And of course, the uh, recent buzzword, AI, uh, it's funny if you look at recent Google search trends, Probably in the past year, you know, the big data thing is being kept stable, and the searches on AI are probably growing exponentially. So AI systems would be more and more widely adopted. Right now, the simple examples of AI systems would be you know, the same systems in self-driving cars, uh, face recognition and video surveillance systems, for example, uh, and then uh, potentially analytics of video streams and the good thing about the use of cognitive and AI systems is that they're potentially going to help us to understand what data we want to store, what data we can safely disregard and not store because it's not useful, or potentially just analyze the data, uh, get some metadata, or you know, create some analysis of it, and just once again disregard uh, the initial data that we got the analysis from because it's no longer needed. And of course, security is going to be also a critical foundation. Previous speakers were talking about cybersecurity. You don't want to be that company that makes it uh, to the headlines with uh, you know, another 100 million personal uh, data breach. So IDC thinks that as much as 90% of the data being created needs to be secured. But in fact, due to different reasons, only 40, 40, 40 to 45% of it would actually be secured. So that's definitely a gap between the needs and uh, the reality. Uh, in terms of where the data is going to be stored, nothing new here. I mean, we've been talking about the growth in the enterprise space for a while, so most of the stuff you uh, create even on your personal uh, devices like mobile phones or PCs gets uploaded somewhere to the cloud. So the amount of data stored in the uh, big CSP cloud data centers is going to go to 60%. Uh, mobile, and not necessarily because of the growth in, in number of devices, but because of the growth in capacity, is going to be also growing uh, quite significantly. And then the so-called entertainment devices uh, and entertainment content, of course, is going to get smaller because previously we used to be getting that content in form of tapes, CDs, DVDs, then Blu-rays. And in the recent years, we're all streaming, right? There's no need to keep anything in your... Uh, local PC or local DVR because you can stream anything unless you are much into torrents, of course. Uh, so the edge, as I mentioned, just a few words on this new uh, buzzword. I mean, of course, in the current uh, data infrastructure, we do have large data centers, hyperscale data centers being built, and we do have increasingly fast uh, broadband networks, but still, there's so much data that needs to be analyzed and some decisions need to be made quickly about it uh, where the count is basically in milliseconds. So you get the data and you don't have time to send it back to the hyperscale da data center then get the analysis back. You just need to process it on the spot. So again, a good example would be the self-driving cars where you need to make the decision immediately, especially in a situation where, you know, as a pedestrian and you need to decide right now if uh, you're going to be able to evade it or a uh, collision is imminent. And then more simple things like uh, even big uh, CSP providers like Amazon, Google and potentially Netflix are building the local distribution networks, content distribution networks because for a lot of people, you know, there's a difference between uh, the ping that they get when they're trying to stream the server or download a web page, etc. Uh, so Edge is sort of a combined, uh, we can say that it's a combination of those distribution networks that are built uh, locally, 
uh, it's hardened enterprise computers, for example, or hardened PCs, and also the end user devices, uh, much of which, as I said before, are going to be communicating not with the data centers or humans, but directly to each other. A good example would be, imagine it's 2025, you are being driven by your self-driving car, uh, all the cars on the highways are also self-driven, and then there's a traffic jam, and then an emergency car needs to pass. So it could potentially send a signal to all the cars on the highway to just move to the right row and provide you know, a uh, way for it to avoid the traffic jam. So stuff like that should definitely be possible by 2025. Uh, and in terms of where the data is going to be created, you know, with the changes in the edge uh, infrastructure and in the system, as I mentioned, there's going to be uh, more data from the edge and a bit less data from the endpoint and a bit more data being created in the core simply because of all the AI trends and big data analytics, etc. So what gets created in the core is example of... Uh, I don't know, like what Facebook was selling to Cambridge Analytica. Uh, basically, the metadata about all your likes, about the pages you were visiting, and stuff like that. So the amount of that metadata being created is going to increase exponentially, and it's all going to be stored somewhere uh, in the CSP space. So what are the implications and challenges and, of course, opportunities as well? I mean, the first and largest one is quite obvious. How and where we try to store as much data as possible because, you know, there's going to be a big gap between 160 zettabyte of data created and about 7 to 8 zettabyte of uh, available storage. So there come the AI system, analytics, etc., where hopefully, you know, some AI or co cognitive recognition system is going to analyze, for example, a video surveillance stream from Casino and decide that it's all okay. There's no suspicious activity there, and we don't need to keep it. We can safely disregard it, and maybe, hopefully, it would be more efficient than a single person, you know, trying to watch uh, 24 cameras at the same time. Uh, moving, moving the data, I mean, it's funny, but even despite all the development in broadband networks and, uh, you know, cell networks, etc., in some cases, uh, the fastest way to move the data is still physical storage. For example, if your company has a, an on-premise data center and you want to move to cloud, uh, to off-premise, then depending on the amount of data you have, you can get a device from Amazon called Snowball, where if you don't have much data, it's the size of a suitcase. Uh, if your data center is quite big, it's going to be a truck filled with literally with hard drives uh, that you're going to move your data to. It's going to drive to Amazon's data center, and they're going to upload that data. Because if you are planning to use broadband in this case, it might take you as much as three, four months. By, by the time you finish uploading, half of your data would be too old already. So, yeah, there are some challenges, uh, and, of course, one of those is also how we're going to secure the data. Uh, but, you know, all these new applications uh, and uh, business models, uh, they will definitely create the, lots of opportunities for the industry in the coming uh, few years. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to focus on our products. I literally have just one slide on the products. Our product portfolio is one of the largest in the industry. We have products beginning from your simple consumer external hard drives uh, that you can use just as a backup to lossy 8 or 12 big hard drives that are specifically designed for media and entertainment industries. In the client space, we've recently done rebranding. Uh, so Barracuda, which was quite famous in the former FSU uh, countries, is back as a client device. We also have Barracuda Pro, uh, Firecuda, and then two specialized uh, product clients. One is for surveillance, it's Skyhawk, and one is for NAS applications, it's IronWolf. And of course, Seagate has always been a leader in the enterprise space. In enterprise, we have anything starting from hard drives, Systems and solutions. We've made several acquisitions in the past few years. We bought Zerotex, we bought Dot Hill, so that's where we built our uh, solutions and systems portfolio. And also we have uh, SSD, of course. Uh, I think we started with SSDs 
back in 2006 with the first SAS SSD drive. So, you know, any, any, any of your storage needs, uh, we're going to have a product that fits it. Some, uh, a few words about technology. Uh, I think uh, this slide is quite interesting. Uh, actually, on the, uh, the x-axis, you're going to see the average density uh, in gigabyte per square inch. That was possible with different technologies dating back to you know, when Seagate was started. And uh, I think for a while, both uh, the hard drive industry and also the CPU industry we were able to follow Moore's law, where basically your CPU, uh, CPU performance, or rather clock speed of CPU, and the capacity of hard drives was doubling. I mean, in 18 months' time. Of course, it was easier to do when you had 160s, 250s, and then in a year's time, you could double it to 500s. Uh, now, I think, looking at AMD's presentation before and also looking at what we are facing, the pace has slowed, of course. You know, we probably uh, released 10 TB drives about two or three years ago, and uh, we're still nowhere near, neither us nor competition is nowhere near to doubling that capacity to 20 terabyte. But we do have the roadmap to get there. And also what's interesting over here is that uh, you don't just invent those technologies that are going to uh, be working in your hard drives uh, in the next 10 to 15 years overnight. You need to invest in R&D for, conti for continuous period of time, like the example with uh, perpendicular magnetic recording, uh, which uh, was in our drives kind of starting with 2004, I would say, lasting us nearly to 2014. So it was a journey of about 10 years to get the product and technology ramped up, to get the yields up. And right now we are working also, uh, not an overnight thing, but we've been working quite a while on the technology that's going to uh, take us to next level. And that's basically the so-called HAMR, heat-assisted magnetic recording, that should allow us to get to 40 TB, to as much as 40 TB, but gradually. Once again, not overnight. Uh, most of those technologies were, of course, using in our fastest growing uh, segment, that's Nearline and Mission Critical. Uh, so Mission Critical is a separate thing. On Mission Critical, we're not going to have any new R&D investments or any products being launched. So it's kind of, its share is being eaten away slowly by NAND, but we're still going to produce the drives for another two, three, maybe four years, as long as there's demand in the market. It's still a good business, you know, several million drives uh, uh, per quarter, definitely. And then all the new uh, technologies are going to be introduced in the nearline space. So, uh, for example, we're going to continue focusing on the so-called cold storage, capacity optimized, things like shingled magnetic recording. Uh, then we're going to continue with the helium and hammer. And apart from that, uh, as the drives get larger, they go to 16 TBs and above, there's definitely going to be a challenge with performance because the IOPS per gigabyte or per terabyte would be getting smaller and smaller. And that's where we would come with the parallelism solution. Uh, we're going to introduce, we already announced it, we're going to introduce the drives with dual actuators, uh, which should help us to get the performance up in high capacity drives. Uh, some of the recent technologies that we've been working on uh, and also some info about uh, how much the aerial density increase they could yield. But honestly, uh, SMR to DMR, the, <coughs> the aerial density increases were quite small, 10% to extra 5%. And the technology that we are mostly focusing on right now is going to be Hammer. But it's going to be Hammer incorporating all of the technologies that we worked on in the last few years as well. And helium is a thin, thin in itself. Maybe we can say it's not sort of intensive growth, but extensive because uh, we didn't increase the aerial density of the media, but we just increased the uh, amount of uh, heads and disks that you could fit in the standard 3.5 inch enclosure. So Hammer, Hammer is going to be our next big thing. As I said, we've been working on it since 2000. 2000, uh, we do have working prototypes right now. Uh, in terms of physics, it's going to be you know, future nanotechnology. We are putting a laser 
uh, on the end of the head and uh, before reading or writing from the surface, it's going to heat it up to as much as 200 degrees Celsius and then quickly move to another track while it uh, uh, kind of cools down. So technology is already working and I think we would have first shipments maybe end of this year or beginning of next year. So this is the technology that should be able to get us, as I said, to about 40 terabyte of capacity with 7 terabyte per disk. A uh, few words on the current industry situation. Uh, basically, this, is, uh, this slide shows the amount of near line capacity that we shipped. And uh, why I think it's interesting is uh, it really corresponds to the same uh, data sphere growth slide with the exponential growth that I was showing in the beginning. Like imagine just in fiscal year 12, we were shipping under five uh, zettabyte, oh sorry, it's exabyte, under five exabyte of storage and then six years later we are nearly shipping 10 times more, uh, 40 exabytes last quarter. Another segment that also drives you know, huge growth uh, in the demand and storage is video surveillance. But uh, <clears throat> it's interesting in the sense that video surveillance is a good example of where uh, you know, not all the data that you record needs to be stored. So either depending on your retention time requirements or on the possibility of using some AI or face recognition systems, you may decide not to store all the data that you've recorded. Uh, hard drive market share. I mean, as most of you know, the, there are only... Uh, two competitors left besides Seagate in the industry, so we're sort of <coughs> an industry with three players. And if we look at units uh, for last quarter, this is last quarter results, <coughs> we're quite evenly split uh, with our largest competitor, WD. And then we have Toshiba with about 22% <coughs> in units, sorry. But Devil is in, in the details here. <coughs> if we switch to <coughs> capacity, <coughs> sorry, uh, if we switch to capacity, then you know both us and WD ship in much more enterprise drives. Uh, we get our share up to 40 percent plus, and Toshiba is just down with 12 percent. Last and most important question on uh, Flash. So, uh, you know, as I said, when I joined, people were al already asking, like, how much time is left for the hard drives? Obviously, you know, NAND is just going to overtake the industry in five, six, seven years. Well, <clears throat> looks like it's not going to be the case. Uh, so this wonderful slide shows the difference in, in production capacity of HDD industry in, oh sorry, in uh, blue and the NAND industry in green. So despite the fact that uh, NAND industry is probably going to grow at a slightly quicker pace, still in 2, 3, and if we <coughs> draw it beyond 2020 in 5, 7 years, hard drive is going to be as much as 60% <coughs> of all uh, available capacity in the world. Uh, this is just one example of uh, uh, how our customers are using tiered solutions. And this is also, I mean, it's also true for basically any of your data centers where you have tiered storage. So <clears throat> the data that you need to, the hot data that you need to process quickly would get stored on flash, uh, but then eventually, you know, it all gets stored on hard drives. And the percentage that uh, the percentage of flash that you would need for caching would, shouldn't be more than 10 to 20 percent probably. So uh, the hard drives and the flash in the data center are not exclusive, they are mutually beneficial. And of course we're going <coughs> to continue our investments in flash. Uh, we were one of the few first companies that uh, started doing hybrid hard drives. Uh, we bought LSI technology, controller technology, so we definitely know what we're doing. Right now we are working on getting uh, some more uh, NAND supply. So we have an LTA in place with Micron and Toshiba. And we are also part of the consortium uh, 
uh, that is planning to buy TMC, uh, Toshiba Memory Corporation, together with uh, Apple and Bain Capital. Uh, that deal is being kind of reviewed by governmental authorities, but uh, hopefully it should all be fine and it should be closed soon. <clears throat> Last slide from my side and actually just reiterates <clears throat> what I just said, uh, that uh, uh, in data centers, SSD and HDD go hand in hand. They are mutually beneficial and very important. The cost models that we are looking at and our competitors looking at, they, uh, neither of those cost models shows uh, that uh, cost of NAND or cost of flash would be lower than cost of hard drives, uh, dollar per gigabyte uh, for hard drives, even beyond 2020. <laughs> and I think recent shortages that uh, all of you or most of you have experienced uh, with NAND recently support that thesis as well. Like when there's event of whole industry transitioning to another technology like 3D, you know, you've seen prices going up and you've seen allocation on the market as well. So, of course, yeah, as I said, we, we continue to focus both on HDD and uh, uh, NAND development. Uh, and, you know, stay tuned. We're going to launch more exciting products. Uh, meanwhile, if you have any que questions, <coughs> I suggest you can come to our booth or find me later. Thank you. Thank you very much for nice vision also on, on the data and tracks. Very quick question, very quick one. Sure. From your pers personal perspective, when are we going to see, for instance, in the United States of America, the trucks are driving on their own? When is this going to happen, reality, in the truck business? Uh, it's not related to hard drives, of course, but yeah. personally, I think, you know, they, they are already testing autonomous, autonomous fleets where you have like a bunch of trucks and the first one is driven by a human and then the next one just drive close to it. But a fully autonomous one, I don't know, Tesla starts to get pre-orders, maybe another two, three, four years tops. Okay, we'll see, we'll so see. So 2020. Uh, but the idea is that the flash driver still, it's, it's a trendy thing to have. No, no, no need to... Of course. Yeah. Of course. And hard drive is also, you know, they'll continue to be around. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, have a